Um, hello, everyone. I am Wakar Akil, and I'll be presenting our paper on CISP, a speed of light internet service provider. Over the years, bandwidth on the internet has increased substantially. But what's much harder to improve is latency. Let's run a little experiment to get uh, a check on application latency on the public uh, internet. For this experiment, we fetch the HTML for the oatmeal.com. It is a moderately popular website. The HTML is 20 kilobytes, and from my well-equipped machine, it took half a second to complete the download. That may sound reasonable at first, but how fast could it actually have been? The lower bound of latency between two locations, as physics dictates it, is the time it takes light to make a single round trip. We call this C latency. The server for the oatmeal.com is in Portland, and my client is in Washington, DC. That's more than 7,000 kilometers round trip, and at the speed of light in vacuum, it would take just 25 milliseconds to make that round trip. Yet it takes half a second to complete this experiment, which is 20 times the lower bound, so we see 20x inflation. In a larger experiment with clients in over 100 countries, uh, we found the median inflation to be 37 times. Let's see where exactly the 37 times inflation is coming from. As you can see in the plot, most steps needed to complete an HTTP transfer, such as DNS, TCP transfer, etc., are each inflated five times or more in the median. But at the network layer, where round trip time is a fundamental performance metric, the RTT itself is inflated three to four times in the median, and tail inflation is a lot worse, even as much as 100 times. This inflation at the network layer has a multiplicative effect on the higher layers as each round trip takes more time. So we make it our rather ambitious goal to bring the inflation at the network layer down to 1x, and our grand challenge then becomes to deliver packets on the public internet at the speed of light. To do that, we design an internet service provider that operates at nearly the speed of light, which we call CISP. Now, why is packet delivery in the internet so slow? The main reasons are that routing in the internet is circuitous, packets don't always go from A to B, they're first routed to C, which often makes the path much longer. Even when packets are routed optimally, fiber is not line of sight straight. It has to follow the terrain, and that also causes inflation. And lastly, the speed of light in glass is just lower than it is in vacuum or air. That basic fact accounts for 1.5x inflation. So what is line of sight and does not slow down light? That's wireless. In fact, wireless networks make up, well, make up the world's fastest wide area networks today. The high frequency trading or HFT industry has deployed microwave networks and made them faster and faster over the years. This is why you'll hear about HFT in this talk more than you probably want to. The reason the HFT industry needs such fast networks is that they deal in something called latency arbitrage. Here's an example of how latency arbitrage could work between Chicago and New York. Say a commodity is being traded in both markets. When a price-changing event, such as the execution of a large sell order, happens in Chicago, information about this event will travel to New York and bring its price down. Now, if that trader in New York finds out about the sale in Chicago before anyone else does, they are able to sell that commodity at a stale but higher price, which drives the profits. So HFT is a multi-billion dollar industry, and the latency arbitrage model means that they spend millions of dollars over the tiniest increases in speed. Between the two markets, uh, you see Chicago on the left side and New York, uh, there was originally fiber connectivity, which you see as the crooked red line here. That was too high latency, so spread networks laid a new shorter fiber path, which you see in green, but that was not fast enough either, so the industry switched to wireless which is the McKay Brothers Network in orange. But they were still not done, so they straightened up the path as the blue trade works line here shows. It's almost an exact straight line. And HFT networks have now gotten so fast that some operate within 1% of the speed of light, 1% of the physical lower bound. Let's do a quick background on microwave transmission. Microwave towers have been around since the 60s, and this photo shows one of the old ones. But since then, both the technology and the applications have changed a lot. Switching latency has been brought down to a few microseconds. 
Bandwidths of around one Gbps are now achievable over long distances. Costs of setting up a tower vary widely across locations, but if we do a rough average, it costs around $75,000 to set up a 500 Mbps link on an existing tower. The average cost for setting up a new tower is $100,000, but the good news is that lots of usable towers already exist. So microwave networks are really fast, but current deployments are basically point-to-point -point links designed for a very special application. How do we use that technology to make a general purpose CISP? That raises a lot of questions, like where do we place the towers? What about the low bandwidth compared to fiber? Will it be resilient to weather? How much will it cost? To answer these questions, let's dive into CISP design. To design the CISP, the first step is to select which cities you want to connect. That selection will probably be made with the, some combination of population, internet traffic, and commercial reasons in mind. Next, we identify feasible hops from a database of existing towers. There are certain conditions that decide whether a pair of towers can be connected. The towers must be high enough to clear the Earth's curvature. Uh, this condition doesn't apply to you, though, if you believe the Earth is flat. The towers also need to clear any obstructions like hills and tree canopy uh, in the Fresnel zone. We get the width of the Fresnel zone from this equation over there, up there. Uh, the towers should not be more than 100 kilometers apart for attenuation and refraction reasons. With N cities, it is not feasible to, uh, once we have identified the feasible hops, we pick the shortest path that links a given pair of cities. With N cities, it is not feasible to make all N square links within a limited budget. So we have to select an optimal subset of links. And that becomes a constraint optimization problem. We formulate this problem as an integer linear program, and we omit the details of that formulation here. So now we see what kind of network our algorithm designs for a set of concrete inputs. We design a CISP for the United States with a budget of 3,000 towers. As input, we select the 120 largest population centers in the US. We use a gravity model traffic matrix. We get tower data from FCC, American Tower, and other databases and terrain data from, uh, in terrain data, buildings, tree canopy, and other ground clutter from NASA. We use the intertubes data set for existing fiber links, and we set an aggregate target bandwidth of 100 Gbps. To get an idea of the scale of the problem, this is what the American Tower database looks like. From these towers, we identify feasible hops based on height, distance, and terrain restrictions. Then we select the shortest links between pairs of cities. This set of links, along with the fiber links and traffic matrix, feeds into the constraint optimizer. And that finally gives us the design of a CISP for the US. So here's the output design zoomed in. The red dots on the map are population centers. The smaller gray dots are microwave towers. The blue, green, and red lines are links of up to 1, 4, and 9 Gbps capacity. And the dashed line is fiber. Our optimizer picks fiber when it cannot find uh, existing towers for a lower latency microwave link. This network will provide an average latency inflation of just 5% over the lower bound of uh, theoretical lower bound. The cost of this network amortized over five years of operation comes out to be 81 cents per gigabyte. Now there are different deployment models that reduce the cost even further, but this is like a worst case situation. So all this analysis is good, but is microwave really capable of providing low latency at long distances? Like, will it work actually in practice? To measure a real long distance microwave network, we acquired access to the McKay Brothers high frequency trade network between Chicago and New York. This industry is so competitive and secretive that it took us two years just to get access. And we are very grateful that we did. Uh, our two on points for this experiment were uh, over 1,100 kilometers apart. The round trip time we measured was consistently at 7.7 .7 milliseconds. For comparison, light takes 7.6 milliseconds to make this round trip. And it is quite impressive that we see at the application layer only 1.3% inflation over the physical lower bound. We had access to a limited slice of the network, so in terms of bandwidth, we were only able to establish a lower bound of 120 Mbps. The network was running with absolutely no error correction. So we saw high packet loss even in normal weather. And also we had no visibility or control at lower layers, so we couldn't run our own error correction either. 
We inferred from packet traces that although the packet loss rate was high, the underlying bit error rate was quite manageable on the order of 10 to the minus 5. This is because a single bit corruption can cause the whole packet to be dropped. This level of bit error rate can be easily corrected, though, with lightweight forward error correction with negligible latency and bandwidth overheads. Now let us see uh, if bad weather can significantly degrade overall CISP performance. At the 6 to 11 gigahertz range, rain is the biggest uh, factor for attenuation. There are other factors like wind, but rain is the most dominant. For this analysis, we stay conservative and consider a link completely down if attenuation exceeds a threshold of 1.5 decibels per kilometer. We gather weather data for the US for a year and simulate links going up and down based on precipitation. Here we plot a CDF of the best 99th percentile and worst latency inflation or stretch of CISP over the year. We see that stretch stays very low even in bad weather. This is because as some CISP links go down, other low latency links are still up. Actually, 20, uh, 99th percentile latencies remain the same as best fair weather latencies. Even the worst latencies are not significantly downgraded. And of course, uh, stay much lower than the fiber latencies. But what you just saw was based on models of attenuation. Is microwave resilient to weather in practice? Because trade networks are very secretive and we were lucky to get even the data that we have, we had to turn to another method to answer this question. Specifically, we used commodity trading data timestamped at microsecond scale from markets in Chicago and New York to infer the latency of information transmission between these locations. As we discussed before, events or stimuli happening in Chicago tr trigger trades or a response in New York. For each stimulus event in Chicago, we count the number of trades that take place in New York at each microsecond delay. And the lag between stimulus and response indicates the latency of networks used to send that information. Here's a heat map of the number of trades at each time delay over three weeks of market operation. The x-axis on this plot, sorry, the x-axis on this plot is the time delay since the stimulus event in Chicago. The y-axis is showing uh, 15 days of market operation. And the color shows the number of trades that happened in New York at each microsecond delay. Because of how the Chicago market operates, for every event, there are actually two stimulus events uh, 200 microseconds apart, and we see two responses in New York, also 200 microseconds apart. The second and main response is much bigger than the first one. And the red at this main response vertical basically means that a lot of trades happen in New York at exactly four milliseconds after the stimulus event in Chicago. The, the C latency here is 3.9 milliseconds. Now, look at that minimum fiber latency. It's all the way over there at 6.7 milliseconds. Since every main response is at the four millisecond mark, we can conclude that the information that triggered the response traveled over microwave and not fiber which means that at least some of the microwave networks were up at any given time. Even more interestingly, if we zoom into this heat map and try to correlate the response latency with rain and wind in the corridor between Chicago and New York, we see that there's a weak but obvious correlation between bad weather and latency increases on the order of tens of microseconds. This suggests that the networks are responding to bad weather by ramping up error correction and have the capacity to stay up without excessive latency overheads. So after we've convinced ourselves that the CISP can become a reality, we asked whether it provides effective cost benefits, uh, cost effective benefits to applications. Can the cost of setting up a nationwide CISP be justified? By bringing down round trip times, CISP will obviously benefit specific latency sensitive applications, but what about a more general application like web browsing? To measure web browsing speed up, we did record and replay of web pages with CDN cache hierarchy emulation. We say that latency is reduced to one third when traffic goes over CISP, and if we send web browsing traffic over CISP, page load time is reduced by 42%. However, we envision that the CISP and the traditional internet will actually be used in parallel. Non-latency sensitive traffic like video on demand or would be routed over the traditional internet, while latency sensitive traffic goes over the CISP. One could use different strategies for splitting the traffic. We tested two simple strategies. 
when we only send the upload traffic over CISP, which makes up 10% of the total bytes, page load time reduction is 21%. And if we are a little smarter about things and we only send the small, more latency sensitive packets such as DNS requests or TCP handshake packets, we see a page load time decrease of 28%. Now let's see if uh, there are use cases where the value added by CISP exceeds its cost per unit traffic. For the web search industry, we use publicly available volume, revenue, and latency impact numbers from Google. Our back of the envelope estimates indicate that using CISP for web search traffic adds a value of $1.84 per gigabyte. Compare that to the 81 cents per gigabyte cost of CISP. For the e-commerce industry, we look at similar data published by Amazon, and it turns out that even if we just send 10% of Amazon's retail traffic over CISP, it provides a value of for $6 per gigabyte. For the gaming industry, we observe that users pay for low latency VPN services. For uh, gaming traffic, CISP provides a benefit which gamers will value at $3.7 per gigabyte. Of course, these are rough estimates, but they show that there is financial value associated with low latency, and there is indeed a case to be made for CISP. There is a lot more in the paper that I wish I had the time to talk about. Um, in the paper, we discuss the issues of integrating CISP with the larger internet, how faster and slower channels play together in the same flow, um, alternative deployment models that bring the cost of CISP down even further. Um, we also present a design for CISP for Europe, and there's a lot more. And with that, I will thank you for your attention and take any questions you have.